Do you have debt? Unfortunately, debt is something that all of us are familiar with. And we usually think about it in terms of finances. We have personal debt, and we also have a national debt. The last I checked, the average person in the U.S. had nearly $22,000 of personal debt. And the U.S. debt clock for the nation was closing in at $33 trillion. Yes, that's trillion with a T. When we look at that kind of debt, I mean, we just have to ask, how could we ever possibly pay it? Well, that's a really good question for us today. Last session, we looked at the sin offering in Leviticus 4, which urged us to first recognize our unintentional sin and then to realize that we need to receive the forgiveness that the Lord offers us. Well, today we're going to look at the fifth and the last of the offerings in Leviticus. It's the guilt offering. There are many similarities between the sin and the guilt offerings. And as you read through scripture, it'll sometimes feel like the author is using these words interchangeably. But I want us to focus in on just a few of the differences. So if we are to make ourselves as a living sacrifice and ask the Holy Spirit to transform us so that we can be altered and look more like Christ, there is a very important expectation associated with the guilt offering that I don't want us to miss. Leviticus 5.14 begins, The Lord said to Moses, When anyone is unfaithful to the Lord by sinning unintentionally in regard to any of the Lord's holy things, they are to bring to the Lord as a penalty a ram from the flock. Now I just want to stop there for just a minute. I want you to notice that here the person was unintentional, just like last week in the sin offering. But the person is unfaithful, not to another person, but in regard to the Lord's holy things. I want you to remember that because we're going to come back to it. Now we're going to jump ahead and continue reading Leviticus 6, still about the guilt offering. It says, The Lord said to Moses, If anyone sins and is unfaithful to the Lord by deceiving a neighbor about something entrusted to them, or left in their care, or about something stolen, or if they cheat their neighbor, or if they find lost property and lie about it, or swear falsely about any such sin that people may commit, when they sin in any of these ways and realize their guilt, they must return what they have stolen or taken by extortion or what was um, entrusted to them or the lost property they found or whatever it was that they swore falsely about. They must make restitution in full. That means adding a fifth of the value to it and give it to the owner on the day that they present their guilt offering. And as a penalty, they must bring to the priest, that is to the Lord, their guilt offering, a ram from the flock, one without defect and of the proper value. In this way, the priest will make atonement for them before the Lord and they will be forgiven for any of the things that they did that made them guilty. Now, the Hebrew word for guilt offering is asham. And sometimes it's referred to as the reparation offering. While this offering would atone for sin, just like the sin offering, there are some differences. And I just want to highlight some of those for you now. The sin offering, well, there were six levels of sacrifice depending on your status in society, remember? But for the guilt offering, there's only one option. For the sin offering, it can be both a personal or communal offering. The guilt offering, it's only personal. The sin offering was for unintentional sin, but the guilt offering, it could be for both unintentional and intentional sin. The guilt offering that was given by God to his people to teach them that their debt had to be paid and the truth that we can glean from this message is that we have to take responsibility for restitution and repentance. Let's talk about restitution first. What does it mean? Well, for example, if I were to steal a $20 bill from you, to make restitution, I would need to replace that $20 bill and pay another 20%. That extra amount, that was the reparation or the restitution. Now, one of the most powerful stories in the New Testament that demonstrates restitution is the story of Zacchaeus in Luke 19. 
If you know the story, you know that Jesus enters this town of Jericho and there must have been a little buzz and excitement about him coming because we learn that a man named Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was going to be passing through and he wanted to see him. Now, because he was short, he climbs up a tree to get a better view. Zacchaeus, he's described as a chief tax collector. That's code for cheat. He would have overtaxed his people and then pocketed the extra money. And we know he was really good at it because he's also described as wealthy. Jesus sees Zacchaeus and invites himself to his house. Now, I don't know if Zacchaeus was just curious about Jesus or whether the Holy Spirit had already begun to stir in his heart. But what I do know is that Zacchaeus' house became an altar. It became a space for him to encounter Jesus. And out of that encounter, Zacchaeus takes responsibility for his sin and he makes restitution. In verse 8, we read, But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Zacchaeus experienced a shift or a transformation. He went from loving money to loving people, from thinking about himself as number one to making Jesus as number one. Zacchaeus is a modern day or New Testament example of an altar story. He made space for Jesus. He surrendered his old life and he experienced transformation. Now, if you grew up in church, you probably learned that story. And you know what? We often treat it as a happily ever after story. But let me make this a little bit more real for us. Do you think that Zacchaeus just started knocking on doors, handing out money, and everyone just loved him? I doubt it. You know, if we follow Zacchaeus on his way to make restitution, I suspect that there were people who just shut the door in his face called him names, or avoided him because they just didn't trust him. The reality is that restitution can be hard because it means that we have to come face to face with the person that we sinned against. We have to own up to our actions. We have to ask for forgiveness while trying to make right what we did wrong. You may have experienced it yourself where you wanted to go to someone, you wanted to make restitution, but they just shut the door on you or they didn't return your phone call or text. But the Lord would tell us to try, to go and do everything in our power to take responsibility and to make restitution. And when the shoe is on the other foot, let's remember the words of the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses or debts as we forgive those who trespass against us. We need to forgive as we want to be forgiven. And honestly, It's not always easy. I know that there have been times when someone has wronged me, and and even if they took responsibility for the sin, I didn't always want to let go of the hurt that they had caused. But it's not my right to hold back my forgiveness. If the Lord is willing to forgive a sin that is brought before Him, then what right do I have to hold back my own forgiveness? Even back in the wilderness, as the Israelites were making their way to the promised land, God was making a way for them to restore their relationship with Him. He didn't wait until they got all the way through the desert. He didn't say, well, you know what? I'm just going to let them think about what they did for a while. Then I'll forgive them. No, God wants to restore us. He wants us to learn how to get forgiveness and give forgiveness. Now, did you notice when we're supposed to make restitution? The passage in Leviticus says, when they sin in any of these ways and realize their guilt, when we become aware of our sin, we're to act immediately. Don't wait. Don't drag your feet. Don't sit there and justify your actions or try to find a way out of it. Face it and immediately go make restitution. You know, there was a movie called The Straight Story. It was based on a true story of two brothers. 
73-year-old Alvin Strait is not in great health, but either is his brother Lyle, whom he has been estranged with for 10 years. Well, he hears that Lyle had had a heart attack, so he makes a decision to drive his riding lawnmower from Iowa to Wisconsin to make peace with his brother. Yes, I did say riding lawnmower. You see, Alvin doesn't have a driver's license because both of his hips are in terrible condition and he has poor eyesight. But when he realized that the hurts and the sins of his past have broken his relationship with his brother, he decides that none of those circumstances are going to stop him to getting to his brother. And it turns out that their failing health becomes the catalyst that awakens them to the brokenness in their relationship. And it provides the motivation and the courage for them to do whatever it takes to receive forgiveness. I wonder how many of us have a similar story. How many of us are holding on to hurt and anger that needs to be healed? You know, forgiveness is so important that Jesus tells Peter that we should forgive 70 times 7, which was far and away more than the official three strikes you're out stance of the Pharisees. In essence, Jesus is telling us that we need to get on our lawnmower and we need to do whatever it takes to make restitution. Dwight L. Moody is quoted as saying, the voice of sin is loud, the voice of forgiveness is even louder. So we know that the Hebrew word for restitution is shalam. And in addition to meaning make amends, it is also about a covenant of peace. Which makes sense because when we have made amends and when we've made restitution, the relationship that we have with that other person finds healing. There's peace. And that's also what happens when we come before the Lord in repentance. So not only do we need to find forgiveness horizontally, like between us and others, we need to find forgiveness vertically between us and God. So let's go back to the first couple of verses in chapter 5. When anyone is unfaithful to the Lord by sinning unintentionally in regard to any of the Lord's holy things, they are to bring to the Lord as a penalty a ram. The guilt offering was given so that God's people could become right with each other and also right with God. They couldn't just do one or the other. It's not okay to say, oh, you know what? I'm sorry, Lord, would you forgive me? But um, just leave the person that you harmed with the scars that you caused. And it's not okay to make right with a person and not repent to the Lord for your sin. There's a debt that has to be paid. And Jesus, he's the one who paid it. Colossians 2 tells us, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. The only way that we can fully experience the transforming power of Christ is to receive the forgiveness that he made available to us through his crucifixion and resurrection. Do you remember what Jesus said as he was hanging on the cross? John 19, 30 says, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Teleo, which means paid in full. Friends, we have immersed ourselves in God's word for the last few weeks. We have learned the countless means that God has given his people to be forgiven, to be made new, to have a relationship restored by our Savior. These are not stories from history. These are not just good moral life lessons that we need to learn. This is the one true God who gave himself over to be put to death for you and for me so that we could experience his kingdom. We have to make space for him. We have to surrender the life that he gave us so that we can experience the transforming power of our Savior. Friends, let me pray over us. Holy God, Savior, Redeemer, we are in awe of you. 
you who not only created us, but loved us so much that you didn't want to leave us in our sin. I pray that you will continue to help us learn how to surrender to you daily, that we will wake up and before our feet even touch the floor, that we will have given our whole selves to you. Father, thank you that in your grace and your mercy, you transform us and you make us new.